All right, Julia Engel is our guest on the podcast today. Welcome, Julia. It's a little after 9 a.m. in Houston, Texas. It's probably approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So my question is, did you already get your workout in today? I didn't. I'm going to do it when we're done with this. I haven't done it yet today. You have to beat the heat this time of year for sure. I know. It's terrible. I was doing, I had to do one last week on Friday, I think at four. And I would like come in the house in between sets because I just needed the AC. Unlike any other one that I've done in the last nine months with y'all, it was so bad. And I was like, this is what you get for working out at 4 p.m. Well, I know that Blakely shares some of your uh, form check videos in our Instagram story. Sometimes you have a really cool setup in your backyard with your homemade squat rack on some four by four posts. It's yep. pretty legit. <laughs> yeah, Brian made that. It's pretty awesome. My husband, Brian. You're lucky that Brian is made that. I am very lucky that he is so handy. That's so, so true. I, I do want to talk about all the fitness and nutrition and stuff um, for sure. And we're going to get there, but you know, Blakely and I both agree that you're one of our most charismatic clients and we love that about you. Oh, have, thanks. Have you always been like that or how did that come to be as part of your personality? Um, well, I am very shameless. Um, you guys have come to some of my performances when y'all were in Houston. And so you've seen this firsthand, but uh, I have been on stage pretty much my entire life. And so it's just, part of who I am. I'm very extroverted. Um, it's only later that I get home and get woken up at 3 a.m. The jolt in the middle of the night going, oh my God, did I say something stupid to this person? But like in the moment, that's not, <laughs> that's not what happens. Um, but yeah, just, it's just a per my personality. I, I love being around people and I love connecting with people and, and making new friends. Yeah, it's that fun. makes sense. Well, you know, sometimes I think about talent and I wonder if like maybe we all have a hidden talent that it's just kind of under the surface and maybe we never explore that area of our life and never find out that it's something we're really good at. So, you know, you're a professional opera singer. Um, how did you find out you had that talent and how did you nurture that? When I was really little, when I was about four, the little mermaid came out for the first time in the theater. And I remember my parents took me to see that and I was just blown away by the spectacle of all of it. I'd never seen a movie like that yet. And so I remember the, the day the VHS came out, my, my mother brought it home and I was so excited and I would dress up in the house we lived in at the time. There was this like wall of mirrors near the kitchen and I had a Little Mermaid outfit and I would dress up in the outfit and sing in front of the mirror. And my mother was like, oh my God, like my parents were not theater people. They're not singers. They were like, who is this strange child living in our house? And um, I just, that's how it all started, I guess. And then when I was like six or seven, we had PBS on and Luciano Pavarotti, who is a household name now in the US and all over the world, was singing something for like one second. He had a TV show back then in the 90s. And I was like, who is this man? What is this sound coming out of this person? And I, I, looked at my parents and I said, who is that? And they said, oh, his name is Luciano Pavarotti. He's an opera singer. And I was like, I'm going to do that. And you know, like when little kids say that they want to be an astronaut or they want to be a dinosaur or something funny and you kind of pat them on the head and you go, oh, that's nice, honey. And so that's what they did. And then I showed them, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so um, obviously there's probably a lot of things that happened between then and your professional career. Like what role did... Um, coaching and, and learning and that kind of stuff play in your transformation into a professional? So in high school, I was very lucky to have a, an incredible voice teacher. Her name is Janine Robinette. She's an amazing teacher, amazing woman. And I really wanted to, when I went into high school, I really wanted to focus on acting. And then I had this revelation through her because I loved singing so much. And I think I said in a voice lesson, I love to sing, but I really want to be an actress, but I really love to sing and I don't know what to do about that. And she said, well, you know, you can go to school to become an opera singer and you get to sing and act. And I was like 16. And I was like, what? Like pff, mind blown. So she was really the person who sent me down the specific path of opera. Yeah. 
I think a lot of people would see a professional singer or we just take for granted that they're up there do, doing this stuff and um, everything they're doing is just because they're born with that talent. But I'm imagining that you weren't mm. as good back then as you are now, that there was a process of getting better and there's actually practice involved even some, in something that we can all do to some extent, singing. Mm -hmm. Oh God, yeah. It's being a musician. I think being a musician is the thing that has helped me so much in my journey through fitness and working with y'all is it takes so much practice and we don't think of exercise as practice necessarily like training, but it's the same concept of you go into something and you think, oh, this is really awkward. I'm not very good at this. I'm not good at this movement. I'm not good at this technical thing that I'm trying to fix in my voice. And so as a musician, you have to keep working at that. And as a person, you know, if you're trying to get stronger or make better choices with your food, you have to, that takes practice. And so that has helped me tremendously. Yeah, I think that's often overlooked. And, you know, we just see people and we're like, they probably were born like that, or it's probably easy for them. But it's to an extent, I think that that's true. You figure out you have an affinity for something like singing, or maybe you, you know, you're one of those kids in the fourth grade that picks up an instrument from band and you're like, oh, I love this. And I was that kid too. I loved band. And, but you figure out pretty fast that if you want to be really proficient in that thing, you're, you have to practice or playing a sport. It's the same thing. You know, those kids figure out by the time they're like 10 or 11, if they want to be on the varsity team in high school, which is years down the road, they're going to have to train really hard to get yeah. there. I think I definitely took for granted what you can do with your voice because I worked out with you for a long period of time before I heard you sing. And the first yeah. time we went to see you sing at, I think it was at maybe the Mucky Duck, um, just mm -hmm. here, like, cause you're a special kind of opera singer. You tell everybody your, your wheelhouse. So I, it's so funny. This has changed actually since you, since the performance that you're talking about, I know that performance, but at the time I was what's considered a coloratura soprano, which soprano. So the voices are divided into different like voice types or in Germany, they call it the Fach system. And so you have sopranos, which are the highest singing female singers. And then you have mezzo sopranos, which are kind of middle lower voice female singers. And then tenors which are the highest voiced male singers and baritones and basses which are the lower voiced male singers so i am a soprano and when i was singing more coloratura type stuff i was singing really really high and lots of notes so that's what separates that from other types of sopranos you, you they're further subdivided into so many other different things um but these days since having my son my voice filled out a lot more and so now i'm singing stuff that's a bit bigger and it's not as high and it's not as flashy. It's more, it's called like for more of like a full lyric soprano voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These days. I mean, when you opened your mouth, <laughs> we heard what you could do. We, I mean, I didn't know that the human voice could even do those kinds of things. It was just like the third dimension was just opened up. It was so, it was so incredible. And we well, got to see you, you um, at least one other time after that also in person. So. You came to opera in the Heights when I was really pregnant and the air conditioning wasn't working. That was that the was, show. That was, <laughs> probably, was. that was probably the hottest that we've ever Oh my been. God. A quick story about that night I remember was the, the conductor was wearing a full suit as most of the people in the performance mm -hmm. were. And mm -hmm. at intermission, he sprinted outside to try to cool off. And as soon as he got outside, he said, it's worse out here. And then he went back inside. Terrible. That's, yeah. Houston. Houston, Houston, in and Houston in late September. That's what it is. Yep. Oh, my gosh. Well, so Blakely and I's history with you and your husband, Brian, it goes back a long time, actually, almost 10 years. Yeah. And Blakely worked out with Brian at Rice and met through that group. And then you two were kind of founding members of our garage gym, the Houston Barbell Club, which eventually turned into Triac CrossFit, which eventually turned into I'm wearing Digital that shirt Barbell. Today. I'm wearing <laughs> my Triac shirt. Houston Barbell tank on? I have my Triac oh, yeah, shirt on today. Go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there was a lot of probably things on the exercise front that 
you had done up until that point, I'm guessing, what part did fitness play in your life up until before Blakely and I met you? So I grew up in dance studios primarily. Excuse me. I started, I did a lot of ballet, tap, jazz, that kind of stuff from about age four or five up through my sophomore year of high school. And then in, when did I start? In, um, in high school, I did marching band and I didn't march with my instrument. I played the flute, but I was on the color guard, which was extremely physically demanding. Marching band is really physically demanding, but color guard is so hard because you're running around the field and we had these cool costumes and we're, we're doing all this really specific choreography with flags and rifles and sabers and throwing stuff up in the air, 20 feet in the air and catching it. And you have to like get it all at the same time. And those field shows are anywhere from between like 10 and 15 minutes and you're running around a football field. Football fields are huge. And I remember when I first started doing that, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so hard. But I was totally addicted to it. It was so awesome. So it was mostly dance marching band. I started running because I wanted to be a better runner when I was like 16. Cause I could, I had no cardiovascular strength that wasn't anaerobic. I could do like, so for example, cause I grew up in a dance studio. It was a lot of stop, start, stop, start, stop, mm-hmm. start. I couldn't run, run a mile. I was like dead after a quarter of a mile. And at 16, I said, this is ridiculous. You should be able to run more than a quarter of a mile without wanting to die. So I started running a lot. Um, and I, that became my primary means of exercise really until I started working out with y'all. Interesting. I did not know that. I thought maybe there was some amount of weight training in there because you seem to have a natural uh, knack for for lifting weights when you started with us in the garage. Nothing passed in the in the ninth grade. I was in the weight room for a gym class and I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. <laughs> was like obsessed with it. I was like, was do I have gym class today? Like I'd wake up in the morning and like see. And, but that was for only, you know, a semester or something. And then after that, I didn't touch a weight again in college. I kind of did a little bit of weight lifting, but it was not supervised. It wasn't with anyone who was really knowledgeable. Yeah. I, we've talked in some recent episodes about how those, those days in particular, where we're talking about where, um, you know, we built out the garage gym kind of we're the beginning of forming what is kind of our training philosophy today that combines strength training, bodybuilding, and CrossFit. So with that being kind of the first time of doing an organized type of program with coaching and stuff, like what, what did you take away from that experience? Like how did it change you in those early days? When I first went in, I would get nervous before every workout. Like the way I would feel, it was worse than the way that I would feel to like go on stage to do a show. It was ridiculous. That sounds so silly, but I would get so nervous because I was like, oh my gosh, it's CrossFit can be, and weight training as well can feel very intimidating if it's not something you're used to doing. And what got me through it was, excuse me, Blakely is such an incredible coach and she makes you feel very comfortable. That's a huge strength of hers as a coach, for sure. And, and you were the same way. And so I was surrounded by people who knew what they were doing. So I knew right away, okay, you're not going to hurt yourself because you've got people in here that are watching you who are going to make sure that you aren't lifting too much weight or that you have really good form. And that's something else that I really appreciated about Blakely so much is that if she knew you were new or you hadn't done a movement before, she'd pull you aside and say, Hey, I want to watch you do this. And sometimes for certain things, she would go, Okay, she'd do this with a PVC pipe. Cause she knew, like, "Mm, maybe lifting a barbell, you're you're not there yet. That's okay. So that was really, really awesome. And and it's just one of those things, the more you go and the more you you do these workouts, the easier it becomes. But I still sometimes, even now, I'll look at a workout and I'll get like really nervous to do a section of the workout, like butterflies. I'm like, just do it. Just stop thinking about it and just do it. Yeah. Your your husband, Brian, we've brought him up a couple of times. He's definitely instrumental in helping us do all the physical 
labor of building out the gym for mm -hmm. sure. But he was very, very consistent in the training in the garage days also. And he, yes. grew, he went through quite the transformation himself, both physically and I'm guessing maybe even mentally because of the hard training that we, he was Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. You know, from the outsider's perspective and being his wife, how did you see it change him during that time? It was awesome. So Brian growing up, Brian and I have known each other since we were 17 for over half of our lives. And he never was like a, a big, like strapping, you know, when, and when you're a kid, you're not, most, most people are not so much like that unless they're like football players or something and they're training really specifically. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until he started doing more CrossFit weight, weight centered things. And with you guys that he, he got really strong, really fast. And there was a summer where I was out of town for six weeks on a gig and I came home and I didn't recognize him. I was like, who is this person? Because he had been going to the gym and working out with you guys two, three days a week. And I think he probably, I'm sure he had probably a conversation with both of you at some point about like, oh, just make sure you're eating a lot of protein because you're lifting a lot of weight. And if you want to keep that strength, you need to make sure you're eating enough protein. And I mean, he, he gained like 15 or 20 pounds of muscle in like two months. It was just absurd. I was like, what is going on? It was awesome. At that that must've been 2015. It was, I'm it was 2013. It was 23. a long oh my time gosh. ago. I know it's like I'm eight years ago. Yeah. He probably went from a, a small to a large shirt during that time. <laughs> I think he that. did. I do. I think so. Cause he went from he, yeah, I think he gained like 30 pounds. Oh, maybe not right in that six weeks, but over the course of that year, like yeah. a pure muscle. Yeah. Awesome. He, uh, he and I were kind of on a similar trajectory. We were doing the same strength program and we were both just like adding weight to the bar like crazy during that mm -hmm. time back in the garage days. I still have some videos on my phone of those old days. Sometimes they oh, pop up man. in my memories. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So um, let's fast forward to November of 2020 when you started training with us through Digital Barbell. So 2020 obviously was a completely ridiculous, crazy year. <laughs> Not that there isn't some carryover to where we are now, but <laughs> yes, um, right. What, what was 2020 like for you during the beginning stages of the pandemic? Where were you at physically and mentally? And why did you decide to jump into a training program? Oh my God. I'm so excited to talk about this. <laughs> so <clears throat> excuse me, Houston allergies killing my throat. Um, the beginning of COVID was, I think for everybody, really stressful because we didn't know anything about COVID and it was very scary. And I, full disclosure, I went off the deep end with, I literally, I think there was a period of pr at least a month at the near the beginning, maybe not right away, but like the whole month of April of 2020, all I did was bake and eat chocolate chip cookies and drink wine. It was very unhealthy. Like don't 10 out of 10, don't recommend, don't do that. Because I didn't know, I didn't have any other way to cope of my normal ways to cope because I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't hang out with my friends in person. I, I had realized before I started, before COVID, I was a part of a, a dance studio called Soundbox and I was on teams there for two years and I had that stopped right away. And I couldn't practice any kind of dance related anything at home because I had um, strained my right hamstring. So I realized you have to be sedentary if you want this to heal. So not only was it COVID, I also went from dancing six to 10 hours a week to doing nothing physically. It did not do good things for my mental state. And so that kind of got better. I did stay off my hamstring for about three or four months, which sucked, but it was worth it in the end. And then I started to run again a little bit and do some, some um, lifting things on my own. Like I'd be like, I'm going to back squat today. I'm going to deadlift today or whatever I wanted to do. And I still wasn't eating super well. And I had seen advertisements for you guys for a long time. 
and I really wanted to do it and sign up in August, but I still was coming off that hamstring thing. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready yet. I got to wait. I think I'm, I'm not quite physically ready. And so then in October, when I saw another one for the next three month um, period, I was like, I have to do this. I have to do this. It's time. I know these people, they're friends of ours. I, I had had other, another good friend of mine is also a part of the program. And she had been posting all these amazing videos of herself doing all these workouts and she was doing real pull-ups and like, um, bent over rowing like 60 pounds. And I was like, Oh my God, it's time. Shout out to Kyla. <laughs> Kyla. Yes. Yes. So that's why you jumped in. You were just that's really why I ready. Jumped in. You, I you needed it. Yes. Well, um, that was a good day for sure. I know Blakely agrees. So in addition to being one of our most char uh, charismatic clients, you're also one of the most consistent. We get reports in True Coach of our clients consistency and you're up there at the top of the list over the Oh, good. over the long term. So Okay, good. What <laughs> I know do you lately think it is hasn't like, been. What is the secret to staying consistent with a with a fitness program? Or what keeps you consistent at least? So for me, I think that's primarily a twofold thing. It is the fact that I'm, I get the workouts from you guys and, and Blakely wants videos of things. And so that for me was such a game changer because it's one thing if you're working with somebody or you're doing something online and you get a program and you have everything laid out, but the fact that I'm taking videos of myself and sending it and I know someone is going to watch it and is going to comment back on things. And if there's an issue, Blakely's very specific saying, Hey, you know, like you're like my knees come in sometimes when I'm back squatting. That's like one of my bad habits that I'm, and it's hard to, to know that when you're in the moment that that's what you're doing. Cause sometimes you can't feel it. So just knowing that I'm going to have someone look at what I'm doing is huge. <clears throat> and then I, I guess like starting out really consistent because you're excited about something, but then it becomes a habit. That was a really big thing for me. And if I don't exercise for whatever reason, like there have been a few times in the last six months where I'd miss two workouts a week, three workouts a week because of the circumstances that I was under at the time. And I notice after two full days with no exercise, I feel very fidgety and I feel very uncomfortable. And then if I go and do a workout and sweat for 90 minutes or two hours or however long it takes me, I'm like, oh, thank God. I needed that. Yeah. Do you feel like you're at the point in your journey? I like this is a place I know that Blakely and, our, and I are at because we've done this so long that <clears throat> we're also motivated by just the process of going out and getting a little bit better each day. You know, you log your results in True Coach. You can look through the exercise history and see what you did last time. Does mm -hmm. that spur you on to want to stay consistent and to push harder? Yes, absolutely. Sometimes it can be kind of hard to see the forest through the trees. The biggest thing that has happened to me in most recent months, like the last two or three months, were that I started for the first time in my life. I'm 35 years old. I'm doing strict pull-ups and chin-ups now. And that was always a goal of mine that I had for a long time. And I remember there were times, you know, a long time ago where I th thought like, oh, I can't do that. I'm just not strong enough to do that. And of course it doesn't happen overnight, but after six months of really consistent progress and consistency with like, and building up the weight and doing these exercises that are going to help with it. One day I tried it. I was like, oh, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. And I did like four chin ups in a row. And I was like, whoa, whoa this is so cool. That is pretty amazing. motivating. <laughs> that yeah. is, that's just a true testament to consistency over time for sure. Mm -hmm. You talked about your friend Kyla, who was doing some pretty impressive things, you know, back when you were watching her journey. And mm -hmm. you're doing the same things now, honestly. I know you probably don't want to brag about yourself, but what other changes have you seen? Um, you know, in, in the six months that you've been consistent, because let's be honest, all this stuff takes hard work and yes, we want to get stronger. Yes. We want to see, uh, the weights that we're lifting go up, but we also want to look like we're fit. Also, have you seen any physical changes in these six months? Yes, absolutely. 
I, for a long time, not so much when I was younger, but kind of through my twenties and, and definitely, you know, the last few years, I get really self-conscious about my arms, which is a silly thing. But now I feel like I have shoulders that are really well defined that I, I love that. And I, and it, I feel so much stronger. I mean, I definitely have noticed my legs are, look stronger. My arms look stronger. My stomach looks a lot stronger. Those are the biggest things that I've noticed Yeah, those in are the last common, nine months. Common side effects of consistency right there. Yeah. So how does that all like carry over into the rest of your life? Like both on the physical and the mental side, a lot of the things that you're doing in these workouts are mentally challenging. Also, has that affected just the way that you address stress in the, in the rest of your life and tackle hard things? Yes. I actually, in February, in January of this year, I decided that I was going to go back to school to become a speech language pathologist. And I started classes in mid-February. I started classes in Texas, so the worst possible week you could start classes, which is when uh, everything froze. And so I had to kind of put that first week on pause, but it has been very, very challenging. Um going back to school when you've been out for a long time. And I definitely think that because I've been so consistent with the workouts that that did bleed over into the way that I approach my studies and my schoolwork for sure. It's just a, you get more grit mentally, even though that might not be what you're going for because you're trying to be physically stronger or whatever. It absolutely affects the way you approach things mentally. Yeah. Especially this summer. In the spring, I had a very, very rough time because I was going back for the first time and one of my classes was just heinous. Um, but it, it has really, really helped for, for my things that I've been doing over the summer. Yeah. No question. And you're a mom. You have a super I cute, am. You have a super cute son. Oh, thanks. <laughs> he's adorable. <laughs> He's really, he's very cute. He's really funny too <laughs> these days. He cracks us up. in the videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What kind of carryover do you see from your training into your duties as a mom? Well, the first two weeks, I remember this so vividly. There's a little wooded park that's owned by the Audubon Society in Houston. And it's amazing because in the summer, it's at least 10 degrees cooler because it's very shaded. So I would take Alan there a lot last summer and in the fall. And I had taken him, we were taking a walk in the morning and it was very hot it was like even though it was november it was still like hot and kind of that awkward we're not we're still in the summer <laughs> phase right. in houston that we always go through every year and my son alan was tired and we were probably at least half a mile or more away from the entrance to where the, our i had parked our car and he's like mommy carry me and i said okay and i thought oh god here we go this is going to be awful right and my son is not a very large child, but I remember when I would have to carry him for long bouts of time, even when he was a little baby, I would really struggle with that. I'd have to, you know, switching him back and forth from one arm to the other arm. And I picked him up and I started walking and I already felt after two weeks so much stronger. And the more and more we walked, the more I realized I'm not getting tired and he doesn't feel heavy. He has not felt heavy to carry to me for nine months. That's far and away. And not that he's not a little kid. He's four and a half now. So I don't really have to carry him so much these days. But playing with him is so much easier. We went to this restaurant that had a big um, open field in front of it. And there were all these kids running around. This is a couple months ago. And he was like, mommy, play with me. And he wanted to run around. And I ran we ran probably a mile and a half, the two of us, for 15 minutes waiting for a table, and I was fine. I mean, it was hot. I was sweating, but it was just amazing, and I remembered, I said to Brian, I was like, I could never have done this with such ease. That's really cool to hear, because those are moments you have with your son. I mean, those are memories that you're making. That's exactly. Really cool. Yeah. Well, let's touch on nutrition a little bit, because you and I were chatting the other day about how some things have changed in your mindset around nutrition. We did the, uh, we did a month of nutrition coaching together and then mm -hmm. you were sent off on your own to put into place all the things that 
we had worked on. What, what would you say have been some of the changes to your overall mindset around nutrition and just your nutritional habits over the last six months or so? Oh my gosh. I think the biggest things that I have changed and they're not difficult, they were not difficult at all was the ratio of things on my plate. I realized I had to, I had to up the vegetable and I had to cut back a little bit on the carb. And with the meat, I, I, I kind of have kept that the same more or less um, in terms of like ratio of veggies to, to protein, to carbohydrates. And just doing that was monumental in, in the weight loss that I've experienced and the strength that I've gained. I realized, like I think probably every single person that you work with realizes that I was not getting enough protein. That was a huge thing. Um, so I have been eating a lot more protein. I utilize protein shakes a lot more if I am feeling kind of hungry and I need to get to a next meal or if I do a really big workout with lots of lifting, I'm like, oh, you need a protein shake. So I think just those two things have been huge. And then something else that I realized that I was talking with you about was the fact that if I choose to eat something that's bad, doing air quotes for those that are listening to this and not watching bad food, um, that that is in the long term, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I eat some Cheez-Its or if I have, like right now, the bane of my existence, but also I love them. Uh, we have Reese's peanut butter cups in my son's little Halloween bucket. And at the end of the day, if he ate a good dinner, he can have like one or two of those. And so sometimes I find myself at the end of the day, I'm like, taken a couple of those out of the bucket. And before I would have felt really bad about that and really guilty. And now I'm like, you eat really well 95% of the time. So if you eat three Reese's peanut butter cups at the end of the day, it's not going to do anything. That's a huge mindset shift for me. Yeah, for sure. Kind of goes back to that as always <laughs> back to the all or nothing mentality where we feel like we've quote, screwed up our progress, screwed up our Yes. Uh, our day when we just go down that, <clears throat> go down that spiral. When, like you said, like if you understand yeah. the basics of nutrition and most of your meals look a certain way, mm -hmm. then that is your habit to eat mostly nutritious foods. And when you yeah. have two Reese's cups, that is not, it's your not norm. Gonna... that is, that is right. a small part of your overall diet. Yeah. Or even as far as to say like, you know, every once a week or something, if you, get takeout. Like before I would be like, Oh, I can't, you know, and now once a week we, or maybe once every couple of weeks, we'll get takeout from a place. And I don't feel bad about that food anymore. Yeah. The way that I would have previous. What, what, um, do you think that the changes that you've made, like just as far as pushing into a, a healthier lifestyle have had any influence over your, your direct family or your friends? Do people notice, do they reach out to you? Yes. So I, unfortunately I, I can't see people in person so much, but the, some of the friends that I have seen in person recently, um, are, I take like my, I have like a sweater on and I'll take it off and I'm wearing a tank top and they're like, Oh my God, <laughs> what have you been doing? And, and so then I'll, t I'll tell them about you guys. I was actually at the drive through with Alan at Starbucks a couple weeks ago and the barista said, Oh my gosh, you're so fit. What do you do? And I literally, I was like, I know we're in a line. You need to write this down. I work with these people. They're amazing. They're friends of mine. I told, I gave them your Instagram information. I was like at digital barbell, check them out. You know, like it was so funny. It was like a advertisement, but that's hilarious. <clears throat> you checks in the mail for that. <laughs> but she was so complimentary. And that was the first time that I had ever been complimented by a complete stranger. And yeah, who, and I, I reached those, out to that, that always makes us, I mean, personally speaking, that always makes us feel good when we get a compliment like that. And one of our, yeah. one of the main missions of Digital Barbell is to help people directly so that they can then spread the same information to their network of people mm -hmm. in their life and, and learn that it doesn't take super crazy restrictive things and there's a right. way to do this sustainably. So absolutely, we just love when we start seeing it trickle down through families and through friend groups and things like that. 
it's a rewarding thing. So you're coming up on your one year anniversary pretty soon. I am. Yeah. Wanda. Where do you see your fitness in the more long term, like over the next one to five years? Oh man. I think that I've gotten myself set up for a lot of success just because of the consistency. Um, and there's always somewhere to go. I think the other, but besides the uh, mindset shift that I had with regard to food, I realized that there's never really an end point with your fitness. You can always work on something. You can always train something specific if you want to, like maybe you want to bodybuild more, maybe you want to, whatever the case might be. Yeah. And the biggest thing that I realized, and I've felt this way for a long time, but now I'm really putting it into practice is I want to be as fit as I can and as healthy as I can for my whole life. So if I'm lucky enough to see a certain age, I can function at a way that I want to be able to function. And so now there's no, there's no limit to, you know, just because you're a certain age is nothing but a number. We see videos sometimes of people who are in their seventies and eighties and they're killing it. And I'm just like, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. Or like people like you, you posted a video of the CrossFit games with, I think it was 60 and up. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's me. I want to do that. I want to do that. That's so cool. And there's no reason why anybody can't do that. Yeah. That's exactly the example I was thinking of as you were saying that we, we talk on the podcast a lot about this this spectrum that goes from sickness to fitness and there's all this stuff in between. And as we get older, the further we can keep ourselves toward the fitness side of the yes. equation, the less likely these little things that come up in life are going to push us into sickness. Absolutely. And the only way to do that is by doing exactly what you just said about like incorporating this into who you are as a person. You want to be a healthy person and just continue yeah. to stay and get fit for the rest yes. of your life. Right. So that makes us feel really good to hear that. <laughs> I've also had a lot of sickness in my family, unfortunately. My father passed away of cancer, and I have an aunt that passed of cancer. And they were both very healthy people. My father was, frankly, the most, like, health. he was one of the healthiest people I've ever known until he got sick. But something that happened that was a mindset shift in me back at 23 when he died was that. I want to be able to physically do things with my body while I have the time on earth to do them. And so right after he died, I actually trained for a marathon, which looking back after like, I had never run a race in my entire life. And I was like, I'm going to do the marathon. And I had a couple friends who were runners and they were like, uh, are you sure? And I was like, yep, I'm doing it. And I trained for it and I ended up sick the day of the race, which was horrifying, but so I couldn't run the marathon. Oh. I was so bummed. Yeah. Six months of training. I couldn't, oh I cried gosh. all day, all day long. I cried, but I proved to myself that I could do it. And now it's just a matter of, well, I'm, I'm healthy and I can physically do these things. It's a celebration. Like when I exercise, it's, it's not a punishment because you have to exercise because that's what you should do. It's, I feel like it's a, I'm celebrating what my body is capable of doing. Well said. Well said. That's very cool. Well, um, obviously we're still in the midst of this pandemic, but are you doing any performances live? Not right now. Cause I'm so concentrated on my, on my, uh, studies with mm -hmm. my new school endeavors that I'm, I'm trying to really be judicious about what I do. Um, so I've had to kind of cut back on that, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what then, since our listeners can't go see you live, I'll have you send me your favorite YouTube clip of you oh, sure. in the show notes for this episode. People can go watch you sing. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for this time, Julia. I know that a lot of people will be able to identify with different parts of your story. And Blakely and I are proud of what you've done since working with us. We're proud of who you are as a person, the example you're setting for everybody. And we feel lucky to know you and Brian. So thanks for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. This has been so fun. Absolutely. All right, guys, we'll check you out on the next episode.